Hi guys, welcome to introducing C-Sharp developers to building games with Unity. Uh, I'm Stacy Hafner, and uh, the purpose of this talk is to walk you guys through uh, the basics of scripting a Unity game. So Unity as a whole can be a little bit overbearing in terms of kind of coming to terms with not only just the engine as it's insanely robust, um, but also coming to terms with the different APIs and the different ways that you can go about scripting a game. Um, so. I figured before I got started, I'd give you a little bit of background information on me, um, and then I would jump into uh, the format that this talk is going to follow, and then we'll jump into doing some, some coding and taking a look at stuff. So um, I have been uh, doing game development for about two years now as a hobby, a side thing, uh, in the evenings. And uh, during the day, I actually work on the .NET team, so I'm kind of uh, jumping around and uh, rather busy in both worlds. Um, I started a studio uh, back in 2015 with my husband. We've released three games now on the uh, Android and PC. Um, and we are currently working on two of our more larger games, Operation Brosnadar, which uh, has actually technically gone on hold while we rework some of the mechanics. But the game itself was uh, a pretty good uh, learning curve while we uh, work to kind of understand the concept of writing an AI and uh, creating a, a dynamic city that generates every time you go to play the game. So um, it was one of our, our, our more robust multiplayer games. It was a, a fun game, a great learning curve. Um, but like I said, we kind of ended up putting that on hold. So more recently, I'm working on a game called Battletub. Uh, so Battletub is kind of just a multiplayer game where you take on uh, toy boats that are uh, driving around in a, in a, in a bathtub, <laughs> um, fighting each other, playing Catch the Flag, Team Deathmatch, um, and various other modes while using Power Up. So it's kind of a, a quirky, fun little game. Um, I'm actually a, a self-taught developer, and I just kind of woke up one day, I guess about two years ago, and decided that I wanted to get into game development, and I wasn't going to make any more excuses for myself. And I uh, cracked open Unity, and I just loved it and haven't been able to stop since. Um, okay, so enough about me. Uh, let's get into uh, some of the more interesting stuff. So this talk is going to follow a slightly different format. Um, so I'm not going to build a game from scratch. Instead, we're going to talk about uh, events, some of the events that uh, Unity uses in order to build up a game. Uh, and what we're going to do is I actually have two Unity projects um, that are open. One's kind of an empty project, and we're going to just explore some of the events and when they trigger. And we'll talk about um, some of the, the real-world use cases in which you might use these events. Um, and then we're going to actually jump over to a case study, which um, I've called Extreme Monster Truck. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not <laughs> the most creative with my naming, uh, but it works. So we'll kind of jump uh, back and forth into both of those worlds. And so. Um, before we jump into that stuff, uh, I, I do want to make sure that I get everybody on uh, the same page on Unity. So we're going to go over just a couple of basics, uh, more around terminology and uh, how, how Unity kind of handles uh, certain things. So um, right now I kind of have an empty project here. Uh, and then I also have, um, this is Extreme Monster Truck. So this is kind of the, the pre-setup world. Um, of Unity, and I'm hoping you guys can, can see this. I did zoom in, so hopefully that works OK. Um, but what you can kind of see when looking at the Unity environment is there's, there's kind of a lot of stuff going on. But on the left-hand side is uh, a hierarchy. And with this hierarchy um, are a set of, uh, or basically what is known as a game object. Um, and game objects are essentially just a container. Um, and what you end up doing with these containers is you define their purpose by creating uh, what's known as a component. So if we take a look at the camera, for example, this camera is technically just a game object, uh, but what defines it as a camera is the fact that it has these components on the right-hand side under the inspector. You can see there's a camera component, a, a layer, a flare layer, uh, a, lot of other, um, a lot of other scripts. So you can see there's actually just quite a bit of different components. Some of these are actually uh, effects that are happening to the camera after to make the game render a little bit more crisply. Um, and the effects, as you guys see when I go to play, are actually free as part of Unity's standard library, which is really neat. Um, but like I said, uh, what's basically defining this as a camera is just the components that are tied to it. Um, every game object is going to have the notion of a transform. And the transform is essentially saying its position, its rotation, and its scale in the game world. Uh, so real quick, if we were to create an empty game object, 
uh, we would see it pop up over here, game object, and you can see that it comes um, by standard with transform, uh, and we can actually see it in the scene view, uh, kind of hovering in space right here. Um, so this is actually our game object, which has no model tied to it. It's really got nothing tied to it. It just has its position, rotation, and scale. Um, and what we'll do and look at eventually um, as we're checking out the, the case study is uh, all of the things that end up making up the different components inside of, or I'm sorry, the different game objects inside of Unity um, based off of their components. Okay? Um, so that's really kind of the, the basic thing that you need to know to kind of follow along with this talk and get uh, that, that base uh, scripting knowledge, if you will. So with that being said, um, I'm going to jump over to this slide. So um, what we're going to look at is, is they're, they're basically um, events. And we're only going to look at about four sections of the events. Uh, we're going to take a look at initialization, uh, physics, um, we'll talk a little bit about input events, but we're really not going to mess too much in that area. They're, it's pretty straightforward, so I wanted to spend more time on the other areas. Um, and then we'll look at game logic. Uh, from there, we're going to kind of stop because that'll <laughs> pretty much take up the time, or at least it should. Um, but what I want to have my caveat as, uh, there are actually a lot more of these events. Um, and uh, the Unity actually has a really good diagram that, that talks about them. And at the very end of the talk, I'll provide you guys with a link so you can kind of go and look and start working. But uh, the main goal is really just to get you guys going so that you have kind of that core knowledge where you can just open up Unity and start to create, uh, create a, a game. Um, and so these are kind of the more common ones. So um, we're going to start with initialization. So we're going to talk about the concept of awake on enable and start. And I'm actually going to slip another one in here and I'll explain why and, and stuff when we get to that point. Um, but the thing that you need to know is when you have a game object inside of Unity and you push play or you go to kind of start your game, the game objects are going to get initialized. And depending on the state, so if they're enabled or uh, not enabled, either the game object as a whole or the script component of that game object is going to be what triggers um, for awake on enable or start. So awake is going to happen um, when the game object is initialized. So it's independent on whether or not the script itself is active on the game object. Now that's pretty key. Um, um, again, we'll, we'll look at a real world example of when you might want to do this. On enable is going to trigger um, after awake, before start, um, and that will actually end up triggering uh, multiple times. So if you have a script on a game object and you uncheck the script or you deactivate it, so you can actually do this in code, so uncheck is not necessarily the best terminology, but we'll be doing that in the UI. Um, but if it is deactivated and then reactivated, on enable will run again. Whereas awake will not. Awake is only going to run the one time that the game object is initialized and then you will never have it run again. Um, and then start uh, will run after on enable. Um, and then that also will run the one time. So let's take a little bit, um, let's take a little look at what, what I mean here. So jumping over to the uh, empty Unity project, nothing, uh, nothing special going on here. Really, all we have is a camera. Um, I've gone ahead and added a new script. You can just do that by right clicking and going create new C sharp script. Or um, if you're using Visual Studio, which is what I'll be using, um, you can actually create it in there. So a uh, pretty standard way of uh, creating a script. Um, anyway, so this is our example script. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to add um, a couple properties, so or a couple methods. Um, and you know, I, I just realized I got a little bit ahead of myself. All scripts that exist on a game object have to derive from mono behavior, and that's actually the events that we're taking a look at. So this script, because of how um, I created it inside of Unity, it automatically derived from mono behavior. So that happened for us, but that's pretty key. If you're going to take a script that you've created and put it on a game object, it has to have mono behavior uh, for the purposes of this. Technically, if you were to venture into networking, it would have uh, a different class, but we'll just table that concept for the time being. Um, OK, so we'll go public void. We're going to look at a wake. Um, so if we do, um, we'll say testing awake. So all I'm doing here is I've created the method um, that it would expect, and then I'm just debugging uh, into a log with awake. Uh, so if we pop back over to Unity, um, I'm just going to create an empty game object. 
Uh, I don't really care about naming or anything because this is a test. Um, and I can drag and drop the component here and it's going to add it. Or uh, if I wanted to, I could just create the, whoops, create the, uh, or add the component and then search and find it. So um, that's it. We've basically defined, kind of going back to that concept of you're defining the purpose of a game object by adding components. We've defined this one's purpose by adding um, the script. And so notice here, there's actually no checkbox, right? There's a checkbox here for the game object, but we have nothing for the script. Um, that's because, again, awake will run when the game object is initialized. It, you're not allowed to, or not that you're not allowed to, but um, if you had the, the script disabled, it would still run anyway. So it doesn't matter. Um, so the uh, editor just kind of hides that from you. So if we hit play, and so the reason I don't see anything here is uh, up here you can kind of do some filtering. Apparently I have <laughs> my warning messages filtered off. So if I just click that, um, I can see testing await kind of popped up. So I can see that um, the game object was initialized, happened really fast, uh, and then we saw the awake method. Now if we stop this, so remember uh, the next two that we talked about were um, on enable. Oops, helps if I spell it correctly. Um, I'm just going to pop up here and uh, save some time here, testing enable. And then our other one, public void. Um, start and then we'll do okay so again these are the three that we talked about awake on enable and start now if we could come back here and push play you can see in our um, in our app that we had awake enable and start go now you can also tell or in our game I should say you can also tell there's a little checkbox here uh, which wasn't here before, and that's because now we have methods that would not have run had it not been checked to begin with, which we'll take a look in a sec. Now, if I uncheck this, which can be done in code, it'd be uh, you're just deactivating it, and I check it again, you can see start did not run, but on enable did. So that's a, a good way to kind of feed in code um, that maybe you want to run every single time the script is reactivated. Uh, as opposed to start just happening the one time that it's been activated. So the other thing that I want to show you, and I'm going to deviate just a hair away from the initialization scripts, um, because this is a lot farther down the stack than what we'll be talking about, but I think it's kind of important to know, since we just talked about on enable, is there's actually an on disable. Um, so this actually happens, like I said, farther down the stack, um, but I think I can still kind of explain it. Um, okay, so we have on disable. I'm going to go ahead and push play. Actually, I'm going to uncheck this so you can see the other behavior. So I'm going to push play. You can see awake is there. If I check it, we've got enable and start. If I uncheck it, we have now we have on disable that just got triggered. I check it again. And my enable should have. Oh, it's uh, it did go. So you see this little counter? I have a collapse. Um, so it did go. Uh, but if I uncollapse it, now we can see the actual order in which stuff is happening. Uh, so we had start go, disable went, enable went, and again, if we kind of kept up with that, we would just see it keep happening. So very useful. Um, but let's take a, a, a look at a case where we would have actually um, put this into play with the, the demo game that we're looking at. So before I show that, let me show you the actual game. Uh, so this is Extreme Monster Truck. If you push play, we've got a little bit of a camera zoom. I'm glad that worked, that's actually kind of buggy. Um, we have an animation that's coming down. My scaling's off because I've zoomed in and I didn't set things properly in the, uh, uh, in the anchors. But basically, when that light went green, my controls were handed to me and I can drive the car. You can see I'm kind of moving around here a bit. I've got some steering stuff that's going, I've got some momentum that's happening, and I've got some particle stuff that's occurring behind. So we'll take a look at some of this behind it. So, the other thing you'll notice is when I go through these little uh, checkpoints, a new one of these ends up getting created. We'll also take a look at how that happened um, and some of the concepts behind it. So that's basically the, the kind of bare bones of Extreme Monster Truck. And right now I'm pushing the space bar, which has eventually caused this to stop. So we'll also look at how something like that gets done. Okay, so taking a look at Extreme Monster Truck, um, we'll take a look at Awake. Uh, that's our first one. That one tends to 
Uh, again, only happen when the game object itself has been initialized. It's not relevant to whether or not the script itself has been active. A time in which you want to do this is if you need to follow something that's known as a singleton pattern. So with Unity, if you have um, a script and you want it to inherit from mono behavior, you can't turn it static. And you can't turn it static because um, you can't instantiate a static object, whereas you would actually need to with Unity if you had it tied to a game object. So the way around this is a singleton pattern. Now this is very common um, for when you're doing something that's handling uh, the game management. So if you have a class that's starting, stopping the game, maybe pausing it, kind of that general uh, basic stuff, you'll tend to want to use this in some cases with, um, with the singleton pattern. So the way that this gets done is you have um, basically have a, a public static game manager. So you set the instance to be um, null. And then you essentially do a check inside of awake that s checks whether or not the instance is null. Um, if it is, then it sets the instance to this. If it's, um, if it's not null, then it's going to go ahead and destroy it. So it's just going to basically do some logic that makes sure this is the only one that exists. Uh, so that's all done in awake. Now, if we wanted to take a look at something under start, so I'm skipping on enable because I actually don't have a, a good pattern for that in the game. Um, so we're going to kind of skip over it, but hopefully watching that flow um, and kind of talking through it um, will help with that real world case. Um, something that comes to mind is maybe if you're uh, enabling or disabling spawning. So maybe on disable, you would kill off spawning and then on enable, you would trigger that spawning up again. Um, that could be a, a scenario where maybe you'd want to alternate between them. Um, so the game manager, I, I kind of talked about the singleton side of it. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the stuff that's inside of this class, but it's basically managing uh, the basics of kind of starting and stopping the game and, and checking whether or not it's running. Um, car controller, on the other hand, uh, is actually the, the class that's managing that car movement that's happening. So it's, it's controlling the vehicle and it's setting, it's playing around with physics and, and uh, kind of setting the rotations and things like that. And as we start to dig through these other areas, we'll take a look more in how that's being done. But for the time being, um, we can take a look at start. So again, uh, it starts happening when the, the script is, is first enabled on it. And what I'm basically doing is I'm setting um, the car's rigid body center of mass. Um, and to explain the concept of center of mass, um, if you think about like a typical car, a typical car uh, tends to have um, tends to have the the motor kind of sitting somewhat lower uh, to its center of mass, and the gas uh, gas tank is kind of towards the back, and it's sitting a, a little bit lower. So the um, the car itself tends to be kind of uh, lower heavy. Uh, the way that Unity will typically distribute weight um, is it'll kind of do it a little bit evenly. So when you uh, when you tend to have like a, a car or something that you're driving around, if the center of mass um, or if it's distributed is, uh, evenly, you'll basically like as you go around turns, you'll start to see your car flip over. So what you can do is you can basically define an object that is uh, the center of mass or really it's just an empty game object that you're pointing it towards and you can kind of position it wherever you want to either have the effect. Maybe you do want a scenario where your car is tipping over constantly when you go around a corner or maybe you don't. Um, so you would position it a little bit lower, which is actually what I had done with this game. Um, if we take a look at it, I just have an empty game object. You can see all it has is the transform, position, rotation, scale. That's it. Um, but its positioning is what's important because that's helping Unity distribute it so that my car doesn't flip over when I'm going around those corners. I actually never had the car flip over once, once I set this, um, which for me was, was the ideal behavior in it. So basically what I'm doing in start is I'm saying, hey, uh, car rigid body, which is a, a physics component, um, or tells it the, um, yeah, it's a physics component. I guess that's a, a decent way to put that. Um, your center of mass is going to be uh, this game object. So I'm just basically saying, find your child that's named center of mass uh, and then get its positioning, its local position. Uh, so basically it's position relative to its parent. Um, and then the other thing that I'm doing is I'm just getting a terrain texture name. And this actually, um, it's not really that important uh, for the purposes of this. But basically what that's doing is that's just helping me change the, uh, the particle color, the stuff that was coming up behind the tires from brown to green, depending on if I was on dirt or if I was on grass. Um, and the reason this is sitting here is just because I want to get whatever it's sitting at. So with this being here, I could take the car and put it over grass and I would still have uh, like the green colored particles pop up right away by having it in start. 
Um, so that's an example of, of type of stuff that you would do. Typically, it's going to be initialization type of stuff um, that you just kind of want to do once. So uh, a little bit of caveat. Uh, we'll talk about update in a second, but basically um, update is going to be something that continuously runs in a loop. You want to be very, very careful of doing initial, initial, uh, the initialization stuff inside of an update because that's going to run very frequently. So usually you kind of want to just do that right away, maybe store it in a variable. That way you're not constantly pinging your game. Um, okay, so that's an example of um, the, the three main initialization areas. The next section is physics. Uh, so most games are going to work with physics. If you're doing a 2D or a 3D game, either way, you're typically going to work with some level of physics. Um, so in this case, we're working, of course, with a 3D game. Um, so that's kind of going to be our profile. Just keep that in mind that there, are, there are, is the concept of 2D physics within Unity as well. Uh, so the first one, we're actually going to probably come pop back in on, on these um, because each one is, is an interesting concept all on its own. Um, so the first one is fixed update. So fixed update is, um, is essentially fixed on a certain frame. <laughs> um, lots of the same, same words there. Um, but it's basically like a fixed, uh, fixed time step. So fixed update is going to run uh, every single time at a certain rate. The default in Unity is 0.02 seconds. So every 0.02 seconds, this is going to run and uh, compute the physics. So it's actually considered a best practice that if you're doing anything with physics, you do it in fixed update because it offers a lot more precision. And we'll look at that a little bit more when we hit the game logic um, and the concept of how update works and runs. Uh, and then we'll talk again a little bit about the differences between the two. Uh, but for now, fixed update is uh, default to a 0.02 interval. Um, and you want to try and focus your physics on it. So to draw on this a little more, if we hop back in to our empty project. Um, we're going to hop back into the code. I'm going to get rid of this because we don't care about these anymore. And we'll go uh, public void fixed, oops, fixed update. Um, and then we're just going to do debug.log. I'm not used to typing on this keyboard, so I apologize for my mistyping. Um, so debug.log, uh, testing fixed update. And then we're actually going to do uh, time.fixed delta time. And this is basically going to give us the interval time um, in, in, in delta time, essentially. Uh, so if we pop back over here. We're going to push play. I'm going to pause it really fast, too. So play. We clear it out. Did I do debug? Did I save? I did say fixed update. That should have worked. Oh, I know why. <laughs> uh, I didn't have my script enabled. <laughs> ah, that's actually a really, really good learning point. The two things that, uh, that tend to get me is either uh, I've kind of messed around with the script, I've enabled or I've disabled it, or uh, sometimes I'll jump into VS and I'll, get, I'll go and I'll create something. I'll just get so excited to go test it. I'll forget to add it as a component, and then it won't trigger. I'll go back into it. I'll start debugging it, and then I realize that it was just a silly mistake where I didn't add it as a component. So um, just try to be weary of making sure that you end up doing that, because that can send you down a path of just really long debugging for no apparent reason. OK, so back to what we're seeing. I'm actually going to pull this right here so we can kind of see a little bit more of it. Um, so you can see. I've got the game paused, so it's not happening anymore. But you can see that it was constantly calling that, that fixed update, right? So it's running on a loop, and it's running every 0.02 seconds. So um, again, you want to tend to focus physics in this area. So taking a break and popping over to our real world example, um, I think, yeah, so Car Collider is really going to be, um, I think I actually ended up clearing that. So we'll hide start. Um, or car controller, excuse me, is going to be our uh, example in this. So in fixed update, what I'm doing is I'm doing some of the physics stuff. So I'm actually handling how the car is moving um, inside a fixed update. Uh, so you can see I've got a couple inputs here. I've got the concept of brake, uh, the concept of moving forward, and the concept of moving left to right. Unity has uh, this notion of, of setting an axis. So technically, uh, you could check for an individual keystroke, but that uh, offers a little bit less flexibility when it comes to wanting to enable your players to, to set their keys to something that maybe they're a little bit more comfortable with. So I tend to always err on the caution of the axis, which you can define inside of Unity under the input section. 
um, and then I'll, I'll just set the controls there. So um, before I jump into exactly the stuff that's happening, I want to pop back into um, Unity and take a look at our truck. So um, our little monster truck uh, is this top level game object here. Uh, and it's got the concept of a rigid body, which basically tells it that it needs to work with the Unity's physics system. Um, and then it's got the car controller. This is that script that we were just taking a look at that's handling uh, the movement of the car. So it's sitting on the top level item. Um, and it's got some, some references here. Okay, so it's got the concept of the axles. We can see that it's actually a list. Um, and it's got two sets. So it's got an the first one is the front axle and the second one is the back. And what I've done is I've set it to say that the motor, which is going to handle the, the pushing the movement of the car, so um, in, in, I guess, Unity's world, it's, it's motor torque. Uh, and when you apply the motor torque to it, uh, a positive number is going to move it forward, a uh, negative number is going to end up moving back. What I've basically said in this is I only want my front wheels to control uh, the momentum of my car and I don't want my back wheels to do it. I could easily change that with how I've written it. If I select that, then the momentum is actually going to, or the motor torque is going to be applied to both wheels. So it's, it's really, it comes down to what's the behavior that you want for your car, um, which is nice. So I'll take a look at how this is actually set up on the code side here in a second, um, but that's the axle information. And then I actually have another list of environment particles. Um, and that's, again, that stuff that kind of pops off your game or the uh, wheels as it's moving forward. Those are the particles. And I have a set of essentially eight uh, because I have a set of, of the brown ones and I have a set of the green ones. And um, the reason that I have them separated is because there's actually a thing with Unity where if you have a color range, you can't set that in code. You can set uh, a single color, but the second that you hit that you have a range, um, there's no way to set it. So I worked around that by just adding two sets and then swapping between them depending on where my car was actually at in the environment. So the next thing are a set of properties. What I have is the max motor torque and the max steering angle. Uh, so the max motor torque is basically the car is going to get up to speed only towards 1500 and then it's going it's to kind of cap out there and it won't be able to go any faster. Uh, the steering angle is ba literally kind of the angle that's applied to any of the wheels that are in, in control of steering which, uh, kind of jumping back up to the axle information, is really set here. Um, so that's kind of how the script is set up, but the, what's kind of important to, to take a look at is uh, how is the game object actually set up? How does it know when I'm applying uh, motor torque or brake torque, how does it know to actually do that? And you can accomplish that with Unity's wheel colliders. Um, so if we take a look. I actually want to do these right ones. So basically what I have is, is uh, another empty game object is what I started at and I just added a wheel collider. Um, and I'm not going to jump into all of these properties because uh, the whole concepts behind them would take probably an, its own session all on its own. But Unity has some pretty decent documentation around it. Um, and a lot of it is actually kind of trial and error and playing around with the different values and how you want it to behave. Because uh, this is going to feed partially into, uh, you know, do you want a realistic car uh, that moves around realistic, you're going to want to tweak your values one way versus maybe an arcade style game, which is kind of what I was going for with this one. Um, and so you'll, you'll end up really kind of needing to play around to get these settings right. But the, the key thing is if you want uh, to be able to apply the, the motor torque and the brake torque towards it, uh, you're going to work with the wheel collider. And we'll take a look at, at how that's done here in a second. Um, so I essentially have four, one for each wheel. Um, and then I also have wheel models, right? So these are the actual kind of visible wheel that you see. Um, and I got one for the front, the, the right, and the left. And so I actually have these as separate game objects um, because when I had them all as one, Unity was behaving kind of weird. Uh, so the second that I separated them out so that the wheel collider was kind of on its own thing, uh, the car started behaving a little bit more normal. And the more documentation that I read on how to properly set it up, that's what everybody was doing. So. Um, it's really just Unity kind of behaving a little bit off if you end up having that all on one. Um, okay, so that's really the most important part of how the vehicle itself is set up. Um, if I come back into fixed update, um, we can basically look at how I'm setting the motor torque or the brake torque. And the key thing to understand here is 
Um, if you're applying motor torque, so you're, you're basically providing rotational force to your wheels, to those uh, wheel colliders, I should say, so not the, the meshes, but the wheel colliders themselves, um, you'll get up to a certain point, uh, and then maybe you want to brake. So in this case, I have the space bar set to braking. Um, if I just set that motor torque to be zero, the car still has momentum. It's still going to keep moving forward. And the way to, to um, kind of prevent that or make it come to a stop is to actually set the brake torque. And, uh, the way I personally think about brake torque is I kind of equate it to the concept of a brake pad where it's, it's applying that pressure to get your car to stop moving forward. Um, and the values that I have here, again, are kind of arbitrary. They're what worked for my game. 500 may or may not work for yours. It really just depends. Um, but what I do, so in fixed update, because I'm working with physics, I check for the brake. If the brake's there, I do set motor torque to be zero because I want it to stop moving. Um, but I also set the brake torque to be 500. Um, and Unity, the physics engine um, and the wheel colliders are going to kind of run with that to, um, once I apply it uh, to make what I need to have happen. And I'll show you how I apply it in a second. The next thing that I'm checking for is uh, whether or not a vertical button is being pushed. And that can be either uh, the, uh, the up, um, up or down arrows, right? So it can be either way. And uh, the motor torque, how it's determining if I'm reversing or going forward is, is a positive or a negative number. So if I'm moving forward and I start to hit the back button, it's going to kind of slow down and then it'll eventually uh, kind of come back at us. Um, so how I'm setting that is I'm just making sure brake torque is zero because if you're pushing one of those buttons, you want to move one of the directions. Um, then I set the motor torque to equal max motor torque, um, which is kind of um, max motor torque, the variable that I've I've essentially set up here. Um, it was the one that we were taking a look at. Uh, and then I'm multiplying it by uh, a value. So I guess actually I described that a little bit incorrectly. Um, and then that's not kind of where it caps out at. But that's helping me apply the uh, amount of momentum that's going. Um, but essentially, it's, it's kind of iterating on that um, a little bit to adjust its speed. So the uh, the next thing is the input, which is horizontal. So that's checking if I'm moving left or right. And when you, you'd move left or right, you're really going to want to adjust the steering angle. Um, and so that's really what's being done here is I'm setting a steering value. Um, and I'm doing something very similar to the motor torque. And then I'm just kind of doing a loop. And what I'm looping through is all of my wheels that exist in axle information. And if we come back up here to the variables, we can see they're just lists um, that are storing the information. So you can work with with your usual lists. This could have been an array as well. Um, but it's looping through and it's just checking is uh, that steering property that we looked at, is that enabled? And if you are, uh, we're going to just set the wheel collider's steer angle to be um, whatever the value is. Uh, and then um, what we'll do here is outside of our loop, we're applying uh, the torque value. So whatever the uh, motor torque is and whatever the brake torque is, is getting applied there. Um, and that's pretty, I mean, it's, it's very straightforward compared to uh, what we were just looking at, essentially, which is we're kind of taking a look at the wheel colliders um, and then doing the rotation stuff. So uh, hopefully that, that kind of helps explain um, physics and a little bit around kind of setting up a car um, and getting it to work. So if we jump in, sorry, back to here. Uh, so the next one on our list is yield weight for fixed update. I'm actually going to just kind of skip over this because we're going to talk about the concept of coroutines uh, shortly. And when we do yield weight for fixed update, it's going to make a lot more sense. So we're just going to kind of skip over it for now. Um, the next concept is on trigger. So on trigger is basically a physics check that can happen inside of Unity. So if we kind of, it's moving a little bit slow. Um, so Unity has a concept of colliders, and a collider is basically um, kind of a defined space. They have different primitives. In this case, we have uh, the box collider, um, and you have an on trigger, which basically just means uh, you can kind of pass through it, and it's going to execute an event. So in this case, um, for our checkpoint, if the car passes through it, uh, then the trigger needs to have something happen to it. So. There are a few different methods that can happen in the checkpoint. Uh, so if we take a look at the checkpoint class, we have on trigger enter. So on trigger enter, um, 
is basically the first time it passes through, it'll trigger it. Um, on trigger stay, we'll execute while it's sitting in it. And then on trigger exit, we'll execute after it exits. Um, so really all I'm doing here is I'm checking to see um, if what came through it uh, was the car, was the player. And, uh, and then executing a set of code. Uh, OK, guys, so we were talking about uh, on trigger and on collision, which are our last two physics areas that we're going to take a look at. So um, if we kind of pull it into our, um, our current game, which is the Extreme Monster Truck, and we take a look at um, how the checkpoint is set up, we actually have two, um, two colliders sitting on it. And I did this for demonstration purposes. And really, uh, if you were to set one of these up, you would probably add uh, the second box collider, because that's going to prevent um, the having something that's not a trigger is going to prevent a vehicle from being able to go through it. We'll take a look at exactly what I mean here in a second. But uh, basically, what you have is you have a component that you can set up. And in this case, I have a box collider. And for this middle section, which is the pass through that a car needs to do, um, I have is trigger set. I can uh, actually tell my computer's doing some weird coloring. I apologize for that. Not sure what's going on, but hopefully, you guys can still see what's. Uh, what's happening. Um, the second collider that is there uh, does not have this trigger set. If I hit edit collider, um, I can actually see that's it's it's somewhat invisible, but it's sitting inside of it. So it's a different square. So to show you the actual mechanics behind the game, if I push play, I should have had a switch for this so that I could skip the animation. <laughs> Sorry about that. That is kind of oversight on my end. Um, OK, so if I go towards this, uh, pay attention right here where the checkpoint is. Second that I pass through it, hitting uh, the break to pull it back, another checkpoint was created. That's because I have code that's checking for on collision enter and saying, hey, UI, go and create this new thing and start another timer. Now, if I turn around, I come back at this. And I'm shooting for this. This is where I had the other one that wasn't a trigger set. You can see the car kind of bounces off of it. Uh, that's because it's, it's kind of a collider in the more traditional collision detection sense. Um, if I go to this other side over here, and I try to do the exact same thing where it doesn't have one, you can see I can just pass through it. So it's a good way to kind of uh, create a little bit of the physics in the sense of um, how maybe two objects that collide interact. Either you can have the concept of a pass-through and just a trigger or a set of events, or you can have the concept of uh, kind of bumping into it or colliding into it. Uh, so again, to kind of pop over to the code side of how this is set up, um, I have the checkpoint, which is uh, that, that model that you guys see uh, in the other game basically has this uh, script component tied to it. Um, and I check for two things. One, I check to see, uh, is it the next one up? And that kind of prevents the person driving around from cheating, skipping all of the checkpoints and going straight to the end. Uh, it'll actually, the logic that I have built out will look for the next one down the chain. Um, and then I have the method on trigger enter. So as I was kind of mentioning, there's actually, there's really about three. There's enter, which is going to be your first pass through. There's stay, which is actually going to kind of happen on the repeat uh, for as long as it's in it. Uh, and then there's exit, which is going to happen after it, it, it uh, leaves. So in this case, there's just enter, um, and then we're doing that logic check that I was just explaining. Uh, its counterpart, which I don't have a good example uh, in this game, but the counterpart is basically, um, actually, I'll show you a little trick. With Visual Studio, you can do sh Control Shift Q, and it pops up mono behaviors, and we can just do on uh, collision. Oops, if I can spell. Uh, you can actually see there's a couple here but on the enter, the exit, and the stay. So the same concept, you're just colliding instead. Um, OK, so taking a look at our uh, kind of list of events, uh, the next one in the order of rendering is input events. And I'm actually going to skip this one, uh, mainly because I just didn't have a really good example, and it's pretty straightforward on how uh, this works. The inputs events are essentially um, on mouse down, on mouse up, on drag, or on mouse da drag. Uh, and it's events that happen either with the GUI, so the kind of the UI stuff, or uh, the detection for the colliders. Um, so again, it's pretty kind of pretty straightforward to think about the typical kind of mouse effects that you're using um, as you're working with stuff. The last one is game logic. Um, 
And so for game logic, we have the concept of update, uh, yield calls, which feed into the concept of a coroutine, and late update. So the key thing for update um, is this is frame rate dependent. So the reason um, that, all right, let me uh, actually explain that a little bit more. So the frame rate that a game gets uh, can depend on a lot of different things. How much physics are you using? How intensive is the game? Is it, uh, what's the performance like? Are you kind of taking down the frame rate by uh, maybe doing too many things at once? The other thing it's dependent on is uh, the actual computer itself. Uh, an older video card might get a little bit more poor uh, frame rate compiling um, as it's going, where a newer video card might give you uh, more frames per second. So it's, it's a little unpredictable in that sense. Um, so again, that's why you would typically do physics in fixed update, because it's more predictable. Um, so to illustrate this a bit, if we pop over to our empty uh, game project that we have, and we do public void update, um, and then we do, we're going to do something very similar. So we're going to do a debug, but we're just going to do update. And we're not going to do fixed delta time because that's for fixed update. We're going to do time, uh, sorry, delta time is what I was looking for there. We're going to do uh, time dot delta time. And then we'll pop back into Unity. Um, and we'll clear this. I'm actually, well, no, you know what, this is fine. So I'm going to push play. And hopefully it's going to want to compile update. Fixed update should be going. It's actually a little weird. Oh, I did it again. <laughs> Here's another tip <laughs> with it. If you have the game running and you make changes in the inspector, that doesn't transfer back over when you stop running the game. So what I did last time is I checked this script. Uh, while the game was running, but then when I stopped it, it defaulted back to its state before I was running, um, which shut it off. And that's actually something that tends to get me uh, quite a bit on occasion. Um, anyway, so if I pause it, so I just ran it, but if I take a pause and I scroll up, we can kind of see the order in which things are occurring. So we see fixed update triggered on 0.02. Um, and actually, update went 0.02. So we're kind of going, but now you can see here, update's actually triggering. So time dot delta time is the time from the last update. So we can see here, uh, the time is a little bit off. Um, or a little bit different, I guess I should say. It started out at 0 0.02, then it kind of changed, and it's fluctuating a fair amount. Um, so that kind of feeds back into the unreliability of how often update's going to happen. So what you typically want to put in update is more uh, game logic-esque. Uh, so for a real-world example, for car controller, remember I was talking about the concept of the particle effects and how I needed to do a check to see uh, what, what I was on on the terrain. Was I on dirt or was I on grass? Uh, that's something, that's a check that I'm actually doing an update. It's not physics, even though, um, even though it's kind of happening in relation to the car, which is doing physics stuff. The actual check and that behavior uh, is not a physics type thing, so it really belongs in update. Uh, so that's kind of typically the, the area or the types of things that you would do. I think I might, yeah, I do have something going in uh, the game manager, which is basically um, as the car was driving and the UI stuff was going and it was kind of uh, moving forward um, in the, the time check, that was also happening in update, because again, it's not physics, and that was happening on the game manager. So a couple things um, in that area, and I think we're actually, we're getting low on time. So. I'm going to skip the concept of coroutines. Um, the, the main thing for coroutines to understand is um, they're pretty useful when you want to do a set of game logic, and maybe you want to pause and wait for something, because it allows you to wait for seconds. Uh, so you can wait for a set duration of time. Um, you can wait until the current frame has finished, um, or the update uh, method is finished with inside of the, the frame, the frames per second. Um, and a few other things. So I actually had used it. Um, I had used it as part of uh, the animation. So at the very beginning, when I push play, the car or the camera kind of zooms down and goes to the car, and then it kind of sits up behind it, um, and then that little uh, the little light comes down. So I actually put all of that in a coroutine, um, which is an I enumerator, um, and in this case, I called it Start Game Visuals. And uh, basically what I do is I call the animator. So I actually have that, that movement that you see where the camera's kind of up and above, and it does a slow rotation down, and it comes up behind the car. That's actually an animation that I did inside of Unity. Um, so I, I tell that animation to start, and then I stop this coroutine. 
uh, or I tell it to wait for two and a half seconds. I actually don't recommend doing this. Um, this it, it's kind of working okay on this, but uh, I'd say like one out of 10 times that I tried my game, this didn't work right. Um, so this isn't really a good practice, but it's good to show kind of the concept of you can do something, you can wait, you can do something else, you can wait, that kind of a, of a momentum. Um, what I was actually finding is I think it's, it's cutting it off. It, it's kind of a weird behavior. Um, anyway, so I, I set that, um, I wait. When the animation is in theory done, um, I say the camera can follow the car, uh, and then I tell it to do um, a couple other things. So I, I tell it now to trigger the, um, goodness gracious, I don't know why I can't think of the light. <laughs> I don't know why I can't think of the word light. Um, and then I basically use the concept of a cue to alternate through the images that you're seeing in the light. So that's uh, basically what it's doing is it's dequeuing or kind of popping it off of the stack uh, and then going to the next color um, of the light. Um, and then once that's done, so once I've hit green, um, and each time it goes through it, I make sure that it waits for two seconds uh, before it goes to the next one so you kind of have that animation. Again, in reality, I would probably have not done this way. I would have just used Unity's uh, animator stuff instead of kind of doing it in code. But um, I thought the concept of showing uh, cues was and how you can use that um, was, was pretty interesting in this scenario. Um, and then the, the last thing I do, so I wait again, and then I end up handing over the controls to the player. So the second that that turns green, the player can start to, to drive their car, but they actually have no control of their vehicle up until that point. Um, so again, coroutines are really useful for uh, doing something and waiting. And this section here where it says yield, return, uh, kind of uh, new, this, wait for seconds, there's a few different ones. So there's null, um, and there's uh, wait for seconds, which we're seeing. That's actually the one that I tend to use the most. Uh, there's yield uh, for www, and that'll actually start when the download has finished if you happen to be downloading something. Um, and then there's the concept of actually starting the coroutine. Pop under our, the, I think it's under, you know, I, oh yeah, yeah, I was looking right at it. Uh, under my start game, I just do start coroutine, and then the name of it, and then that's what actually ends up triggering all of this. So it's pretty handy. Uh, it can be a little bit more handy for doing uh, animations over time. So if you're doing the concept of lerping, which is like I have something that's in this position and I want to slowly move to you know, this other position over a set of time, you can do that in an update or you could actually technically do that in a co-routine if you had wanted to. Um, okay, so popping back over, update. Oh, uh, so our last one is late update. So late update will actually happen after uh, update has everything uh, in update has finished. So let's say in this case, actually, I, I have a grand example. Um, so with Extreme Monster Truck, um, I'm actually going to stop and start so you can see this as I'm going. So if we go over to the game, push play, and I hit the play button. You can see the camera is kind of moving down. I almost wish that that bug would have happened so you could see. But basically, um, what happens is as this light is going, there's a point where the camera actually locks onto the car, right? And that's here. Now, the logic for the camera locking onto the car is done in late update because I want the camera to move and look at the car after all of the update stuff has finished, after um, you know, everything's kind of stable for that particular frame, if you will. Um, and so the last piece of code we're going to look at is the late update. So that's exactly what's happening. So my camera has all of those other components that you saw uh, before, but it also has um, the camera follow script sitting on it. Uh, and then that has a late update. And that's basically all it's doing is saying, uh, checking to see, can I follow the car? In other words, have like my animation stopped and it should be locked on is, is essentially what that was. Um, and then it's just setting the camera's position uh, relative to the car. And then it's making sure that it's looking at the car based off of the values that I'm setting and that's it. Um, so, that's pretty much it for kind of the main sets of uh, the events that we're going to take a look at. Um, like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot more to this, and it tends to get a little bit complicated. Um, my recommendation is if you're kind of just starting out on Unity, just take it slow, start learning things bit by bit, and don't get overwhelmed with the, uh, the, the APIs. Actually, it's somebody kind of stopped me in the hallway uh, earlier today and said they tried to make a Hello Game 
um, with Unity and got that up and running, and then they felt like they were just tossed over a cliff because of kind of the APIs. And, and I can understand that feeling. So hopefully, um, at the end of this, I've kind of uh, given you guys the tools to get going and, and start to learn. Um, I do have a set of resources to help. So if you want to get the Unity engine, you can go to unity3d.com and that'll grab it. With Unity, um, if you're installing it on Windows, you're going to get uh, Visual Studio Community as um, an option for you to include as part of the download. If you happen to be on Linux or Mac, you can actually use Visual Studio uh, Code. Um, and then Unity also comes with um, Mono Develop as well, if that's your preference. Uh, the Extreme Monster Truck source is at live on GitHub, so you can take a look at it and kind of dive a little bit more deep into the code that we went over briefly and see how things are really set up in that project. And uh, you know, feel free to extend it or, or do whatever. Um, and then I also have a link for the full execution order. So this is, uh, we looked at a very small subset, um, and I didn't quite talk about all of the different paths. So if you go and check this out, it's a lot longer of a graph, and it's going to go a little bit more into detail about what we talked about and a lot of other stuff that's going to come in handy. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to find me on Twitter. Also, if you happen to create anything and you want to show it off, I'm always happy to see the cool things that people are making. So feel free to reach out. Um, and thanks. <laughs>